and there you have it. We have automated both iron and copper smelting. And we have automated power from our buffered water tanks and coal chests. Let's quickly refill all the furnaces so both sides are running on the same clock. And now that resources are actually accumulating automatically, it is finally time to complete the last step of this puzzle. The warp factory floor, where we will actually process said resources into the red and green science packs we so desire and require to progress. It is the first sign of true automation resembling normal Factorio, but of course this is a Michael Hendricks playthrough you're watching, so you're gonna get a Michael Hendricks level of automation, meaning there's still gonna be more hand feeding going on than in a children's zoo. And indeed, our entire red and green sign setup relies on hand feeding iron and copper plates in meticulously calculated ratios between these seven chests here, instead of using belts like a normal person. Anyway, we already have several things to keep track of, like boiler room water and coal levels, and keeping the furnaces supplied with coal. So we may as well add one more thing to the list, in keeping the iron and copper plates chests for the science area topped off. The trade-off is we have saved some space to both produce and consume science packs at a higher rate. Well, if we actually manage to keep it all supplied. We start off by equaling the count of red and green science packs in the buffer chests, which means we need to make 23 extra green signs. There goes all my inserters. While we complete the science build, we can see the alerts coming in from attacks on our mining platforms, which is a little scary at over 30% evolution already. There are spitters and medium biters in the mix, and we are completely blind as to how powerful the attacks are, unless we actually go outside to check it out for ourselves. We cannot check the world map from inside the factory. Anyway, I had so nicely prepared the exact amount of inserters I would need and such, before I just threw them into those extra 23 green science packs, so of course I run out. Anyway, eventually we complete the full blueprint, and it's time to select the first technology of our fully-ish automated base. After my recent rants, it should come to no one's surprise that we go for the mining productivity tax first. We are producing rookie numbers, we gotta pump up those numbers. These two tags cost 180 red signs and 0 green signs, so we want to produce an additional 180 red signs before doing the balance distribution dance. Meanwhile, the first attack which deals damage to our structures comes in. We really need to go out and check out what's going on, but we don't. Instead, we collect all our resources to see where we are at. So let's forget about those attacks and let me show you my undeniably cool and legally trademarked chest sized resource distribution method. To produce a pair of red and green science packs, you need 2.5 copper and 7.5 iron. So we need one chest of copper and three chests of iron. Unfortunately, we don't have three chests of iron just yet, so instead we collect only one chest of iron and one line of copper to get the correct ratio. These 4000 plates will produce us 400 pairs of red and green signs, if we distribute it correctly. So let's start with the easy one, copper. 4 stacks for 400 red signs and 6 stacks to make copper wire for 400 circuits. The iron distribution is slightly more daunting at first, but still pretty easy to keep track of. 8 stacks for each dedicated iron gear assembler, which will produce 400 gears each. 
four stacks for inserters and four stacks for green circuits to complete the requirements for the 400 inserters. The remaining six stacks of iron go into 400 yellow belts. Our inventory being empty is a sign that we distributed it correctly. So now we can go do something else. Yeah, indeed. Like checking out the damage on our gun turrets. Nope, no more science distribution. Out! Good boy. And indeed, we find piles of biter bodies stashed up right against our gun turrets. Medium biters and small spitters are hard to deal with for gun turrets, as the fast and tanky medium biters take the lead and thus draw away all the gunfire from the squishy range spitters. Anyway, we are being damaged even though we only deal with the fairly generated attacks from the pollution of our measly 15 miners. The war platform's immense pollution cloud is still thousands of Atto light years away. Unfortunately, I don't get to show the deadly biter combo as the medium biters went on strike and refused to join this specific attack. And I don't have the time to hang around all day, you know. We are supposed to be this mod in 8 warp zones, and we are nearing the end of warp zone 4. That is the fifth world, including the starter planet. Anyway, let's complete the last little bit of the blueprint, which are the optional coal belts leading into the boiler basement, while the next attack immediately causes damage again. The final final part of the blueprint will lead the iron and copper belt up to the warp factory floor somewhere in the far future. A quick glance shows the water level has dropped by only 100k or so since we drove off from the platform, so we are still good on power for a while. With apparently 12 gun turrets in combat simultaneously, we rush outside again. We are at 38% evolution, which means we're only 2% away from the higher damage and higher range medium spitters, and only 12% away from the giant power spike that are big biters and spitters. We still won't reach uh, this warp zone, I hope, as we aren't ready to deal with those, but we plan to research the next two levels of warp reactor technology in the next warp zone. That will push our time on each warp zone to a full 60 minutes, which will push us far into big biter territory. I hope we are going to be ready to deal with that. But we won't push our luck in this warp zone. We will first focus on getting maximum production from our mining platforms, getting up to a full yellow belt of ore per site. Each of these five technologies take a ratio of two red science packs to one green, which is a quirk that some of the Warptorio specific technologies have. Anyway, that means we'll have to add another 550 red science packs to the mix to keep the science buffer evened out. Meanwhile, it looks like we have power problems, as indicated by the red flashing icons. This could be bad. But once we go down to check, we quickly find out what the problem is. Me. I simply forgot to build the second half of the power plant. So, once we filled in the final 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 part of our blueprint build, our power problems are immediately solved. Well, with everything built, now it's simply a matter of keeping everything supplied, which is actually not that simple. We need to juggle around everything, from the big things like placing entire mining platforms on the correct resources at the correct times, as well as the little things like keeping the furnaces fueled, and of course, keeping science production going. I tried to show off the 4 full chest resource distribution method, but 
that's a pipe dream. Without mining productivity 10, we are barely producing more than half a belt of iron. So, while playing Mike distributes another set of 4000 plates to the science area, Let me tell you about another pipe dream I had. I forgot to place the final 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 part of the blueprint, which is this pipeline here. But it's not connected to anything. What is it for? And indeed, these pipes are not for transporting fluid. Their only function is to block me from accidentally walking outside into certain death. Which certainly did not ever happen in any of my practice runs ever. Anyway, after playing Mike aimlessly noodles around for a bit, the time has come to go reclaim our gun turrets, or they will stay behind on this planet. A task which is not without danger. A task which is not without danger. And we simply have to hope no biter attack comes in in the short time the platform is undefended. Once the platform is inside, we can actually see that the corner miners are barely on the platform. But uh, I'd rather have you go out to the other miner and reclaim those gun turrets too, if you don't mind. It's a long, long hallway. Anyway, if you wondered what those four belt pieces are for, wonder no longer. The mining platforms are so tiny that the outermost 8 miners actually don't output or within the platform's border. Just like with the gun turrets, we have to manually place those 4 belts every time we go outside. And if we don't reclaim those belts, they get left behind, attacked and destroyed. But more annoyingly, if we forget to place those belts at any time, which is very easy to do and will inevitably happen, Half of our entire mining platform is out of commission, as they output on a beltless style. Anyway, time is up, we are warping out. And we get another planet like our home planet. Similar to what we had in Warp Zone 3.
a giant continent with huge open spaces, no trees and very large but sparse biter bases. With our current technology, those map settings are actually a bit too easy for finding resources, water and loot chests. So here, watch me save scum to get a more interesting planet. With varying degrees of success. But yeah, you can basically reroll the next planet type by doing something RNG heavy, like triggering a few hundred biters outside to attack you. This will often lead you to warp to a different planet with every attempt. Here we hold another planet with default settings, which is fine I guess, but I will make sure to showcase three new types of planets for the three remaining warp zones. For warp zones 6 and 7, I decided to pre-select a planet type, which you normally cannot get this early in the run. For warp zone 6, I will roll a neutral world type, which makes some things easier and some things much harder, depending on what you need. And for warp zone 7, I will roll a bad world type, with increased biter difficulty. And for warp zone 8, well, I have developed my game plan on getting one specific type of planet, and it's probably the only type of planet on which my warp zone 8 strategy can succeed. Can you guess which one it is, and why? Let me know in the comments. And with all of that being said, I will see you next time.